everyone, and welcome to the Spring Luncheon and Workshop for the Wisem Professional Development Series. My name is Annette Pilkington, and I am the Director of the Women in Science Engineering Mathematics Program, also known as Wisem. Wisem was established in 1997, 22 years ago, with a generous grant from the Chevron Corporation. The goal is to enhance opportunities for women in engineering, increase the recruitment, retention, and graduation rate of our women students, and to provide programming, training, and mentoring for MINES students, faculty, and staff. The goal is to build a campus that is inclusive, welcoming, and supportive. To continue the mission of WISEM, this year we started a, a series of professional development luncheons for faculty and staff. And many uh, people, when they hear the word WISEM, they think of SWE, our Society of Women Engineers. And SWE is under the WISEM umbrella. It's a student organization on campus and it's affiliated with the Professional Society of Women Engineers. Um, Kelly Knuckle is currently our SWE faculty advisor and she is our WISEM assistant director. So I'd like Kelly to stand up for just a second so you all know who Kelly is. <laughs> yes, I want to thank her for all she does for WISEM and for women um, on campus, students and employees. Oh, my phone is talking about it. Okay. <laughs> so now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jamie Dandar McKinney. Um, Today, uh, Jamie is a survival expert whose skills have been honed not in the jungle, but rather throughout her career in technical industries where women are sometimes considered to be rare sightings. <laughs> She's just as comfortable in stilettos and sh as she is in steel toe boots and enjoys the diversity found between meetings in a boardroom versus mechanical work out in the field. She stands tall at a very, she stands at a very tall five two inches and tells her highest accomplishment as climbing Mount Kilimanjaro to see the sunrise at the summit. She is regularly featured in the media for her accomplishments and advocacy of women in industry and was once banished from voice lessons because she was told some songs are better sung only in your head. <laughs> so we're in for some fun today. Please welcome Jamie. Good afternoon, ladies. I am so excited uh, to be speaking here again at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, I work in oil and gas, and almost every day my path crosses with petroleum engineers, drilling engineers, operations geologists, and men and women who have graduated from this fine institution. And wow, you have such a phenomenal reputation. So, way to go on that. Uh, one of my best friends and mentors is a woman by the name of Norma Mose, and Norma was one of 13 women in the 1983 graduating class of the School of Mines, um, so it's really neat to see how far, how far you've come. And uh, hey, I need to say congratulations. Uh, show of hands if you beat out Harvard in the brain games. <laughs> fist bumps and high fives around that when that news came out, so good job. Um, before we start, I just I want to say a thank you to someone who does a lot behind the scenes to put together these lunches. I'm not sure that everybody knows what it takes to really put these together and have, and have them be well done. And so could you all join me in a round of applause for Annette, please? <laughs> She really does a lot to make sure that our time here today is, is well spent. Okay, so it's springtime in the Colorado Rockies, and that means something very important, and that is that it's baseball season, right? I love baseball. I love the stadiums, the sights, the sounds, the smells. And years ago, I was watching an interview on ESPN about Derek Jeter was being interviewed. He was the shortstop for the New York Yankees, uh, captain of the team at the time, excellent player, and the journalist was saying to him, okay, Jeter, it's a high-pressure situation. Bottom of the ninth, two outs, go ahead, run at third, batter steps up to the plate, you're standing at shortstop, what's going through your head? And Jeter, without hesitation, said, hit it to me. And he said it so fast and so quickly, the journalist was taken aback of it, and I mean, just like, what did he say? And he repeated it, and he said, hit it to me. He said, in that situation, I know how to catch that ball, I know how to field that ball, I know how to get that out, hit it to me. And I just thought, wow, what unequivocal confidence. I mean, I guess what you would suppose would come from the shortstop of the New York Yankees, but I was just so impressed and blown away by his response. 
Well, a couple weeks later, I was having dinner with my girlfriend, Robin, who's the CEO of a landscape architecture company, and I was telling her about this. And she said, well, I have that. And I said, you have what? And she said, I have that hit it to me feeling. And I said, you do? When? And she said, on Thursday nights in my club volleyball league. <laughs> and I said, really? And she said, yeah. She goes, we play six on six. And when that ball comes over and it's game point, I know how to bump it, set it, spike it, do what I need to do to get that point to win the game. My team knows they can count on me. Well, that really got my wheels turning. Because I will confess to you, I really don't have aspirations of becoming the short set for the New York Yankees, but Robin is another case. And I started thinking about that, not just athletically, but also personally and professionally, what are my hit it to me things? What are the things where I really excel? And the skill sets that I've, I've got it nailed, and I've got a lot of confidence when I do it, and I enjoy doing them. We all have these, right? So confidence is a big piece in that. And it's really neat that job performance will dictate a certain amount of success in life, right? But when I ask people, what's your hit it to me moment? I love watching their reactions. Those quotes that you saw scrolling on the screen before we started, it's part of my research project and asking other people, what is your hit it to me? They just light up when they talk about it. I mean, just their thoughts around it will instantly change what you're thinking and how you're feeling. Your posture changes, your eye contact is zoned in, just the, the, the sound of your voice, it can all shift. And when you focus on those things that you're really good at doing, it increases your confidence. And when your confidence increases, it increases your job performance. And then that increases your confidence and it creates this virtuous circle, right? So it's important to put a little attention around it. I have worked in a uh, male-dominated technical industry for almost two decades now, and I have been tested and intimidated, and when I was the only female, or the youngest one, which doesn't happen as often anymore, um, or the one who didn't know the industry history yet, or didn't have the technical knowledge, my secret weapon to stand tall in those situations and to prove myself as a team player and someone that could really do well at this job was confidence. So my wish, hope, and dream for today is to share some just insights, experiences, research with you so that you can take some of these nuggets and do the same for yourself. So the other side of hit it to me is also that ability to step up to the plate, right? And to do something that's a little challenging or that's a little intimidating. Psychologists will tell you that confidence is often bred not just on that, actually not at all, on the outcome that happens, but really right in that ability when you're trying and you're doing something that you haven't done yet. So it's important to give it a shot. Be able to look that pitcher in the eye and say, all right, buddy, what, what do you got for me? Fastball, slider, curveball. Has anybody been throwing a curveball? This week, this morning, walking in here today? <laughs> I purposely did not check email at least 45 minutes before I got in here just to <laughs> make sure no curveballs. Um, but how you handle that curveball, and when you can do it with confidence, that informs the next move. And I would posit it's a lot better when you can do it confidently. All right, so we're going to step up to the plate today, and we're going to play some ball. Y'all with me? Yeah. All right, great. I know you are, especially you're wearing your Rocky shirt. <laughs> okay, so let's first take a look at just the Confidence 101 definitions. This first one, a feeling of self-assurance and certainty arising from one's appreciation of one's own abilities or qualities. She's brimming with confidence. We all have this. In certain days, we have more or less. There's a, there's a genetic piece to it, but a lot of it is what we're telling ourselves and how powerful our thoughts are. And we'll get deeper into that later in the presentation. It's also a feeling of confident consciousness of one's own powers, one's own superpowers, uh, or of reliance on one's circumstances. She had confidence in her ability to succeed. Now this is a Merriam-Webster, like old school dictionary definition that is referring to our powers, which I think is really amazing. We all have this. And then a faith or belief that one will act in a right, proper, or effective way. I have confidence in her, in a leader, in her as a leader. I think with confidence there is a, an implication that your moral compass is pointing north and that you're acting in an ethical manner. Uh, if you want some more colorful definitions, by the way, Google it on Urban Dictionary. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, just, you know, meeting you for the first time today, I didn't think maybe we were quite there. I don't see any cocktails here, so I thought maybe I'll save that one for later, but, uh, but if you want to give yourself some entertainment, go ahead and check that out. 
Okay, so here's some synonyms of uh, belief in yourself, positive net, positiveness, nerve, guts, level-headedness. When was the last time, here in the honesty chamber, we can, we can admit this to each other, when was the last time you felt like you made a good, confident decision when you weren't really in a level-headed space, when you were maybe just really emotional? It's pretty tough to do. So with confidence and level-headedness, the two are kind of interchangeable. And then, of course, courage, good old friendly lion, courage. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's an element of job performance that will predict a certain amount of success. Yes, definitely no doubt about it. But if you insert another piece to it, and wow, did I slide get a little deranged on that my graphic. We should talk about graphics that more. Um, if you insert confidence into this equation, it will help accelerate that success and help you have a more fulfilling life, both personally and professionally. <laughs> Okay, so there are many gifts that come with confidence, and I'm going to just focus on my, what I think are the top five or five of my favorites today. So the first one is that it is fuel for forward motion. Have you ever felt like you're just stuck in a decision or stuck in a project, and the words and the decisions and some of the phrases are just kind of like in this mess in your head and it keeps turning and twisting, and you have that paralysis by analysis? Yeah, I've had it. Um, confidence gives you that ability to say, you know what, all right, I, d I don't know the future, and I don't know if your crystal ball is like my crystal ball, but it's been stuck in the shop for quite some time now. Uh, confidence gives you that ability to say, all right, I'm moving forward. I'm creating that motion. And that inertia is really important, too, because that in and of itself helps you have some more confidence. The next one is that it gives you a voice. I have a friend named Maria, and Maria has a diversity and inclusion consulting firm. And I was having a conversation with her one day, and I said, Maria, where do you see women struggling the most? And she said, you know, Jamie, she said, they're smart, they're intelligent, they do a great job in their jobs, but they don't have a voice. They tend to struggle with being able to speak up or saying, like, this was my accomplishment, or this was my project, or this, would I, this is what I did to help us move down a path. So confidence helps give you that voice. Very important, especially in that accelerated success side, because you can see sometimes they're like, wait a minute, I got passed over for a promotion or I got passed over for a project when you were probably more qualified than the other person. They were just more vocal about it. The next one is that it allows you to see challenge as an opportunity rather than an obstacle. So picture this. Two different types of women driving to work on a Monday morning, coming up 6th Avenue, sipping on their Starbucks, listening to the radio, and the one is saying to herself, Oh, what kind of challenges am I going to face this week? What problems am I going to have to solve? What obstacles am I going to bump into? Kind of this like, woe is me, Eeyore complex, right? Just tail between your legs and like, you know, talk about some slow motion if at all, right? Then there's another type of woman who, same situation, Monday morning, 6th Avenue, coffee, uh, radio, and she's saying to herself, huh, I wonder what kind of challenges I'm going to face this week. I wonder what problems I'm going to get to solve, what solutions I'm going to get to come up with, and what obstacles I might be able to just bust on through. She has more of this tigger complex, this bouncing and moving forward and moving along and having that energy. Now, orange might not be your color, and tigger might be a little too much for you, but hopefully you can understand the point I'm trying to get across is that you've got two options. And one will certainly lead you to see these challenges as opportunities rather than just, oh, what, am I, what am I going to do? The next one, I really love this one, um, is it's your ability to test the fence. And this is a reference to a scene in Jurassic Park when the dinosaurs were over here and the people were over here and the dinosaurs started to say to themselves, why are we over here? Why are we confined by this barrier? We're smart, we're strong, we're capable. Why are we over here? There's a lot more over there. I want to be on that other side. And they start to test that fence, right? One of my uh, mentors and coaches was just saying to me a couple months ago, you know, Jamie, I find myself hitting my head up against that glass ceiling. And she goes, one of these days, I'm going to break through it. So having confidence gives you that ability to, all right, we're going to test this fence because there's absolutely no reason that we shouldn't be on the other side as well. And then the last one on the top five is that confidence is contagious. 
you know how they say if you want to get better at doing something, surround yourself with people who are good at doing it, better than you, whether it's basketball or crocheting or coding or whatever the case may be. Confidence works that same way. It's very contagious. So surrounding yourself and being more mindful of those people in your life that have confidence and trying to get closer to them can really help. It's also something that you can dish out and you can provide to others. Uh, you know we talk about role models a lot more I think when we're younger, but I think they're just as important to have as adults. And I will share one of mine with you and you feel free to borrow her. I don't know her, I've never met, I've never met her so maybe someday I will, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, mad respect for that woman, right? Supreme Court Justice, I think she might make you look tall if we were side by side, which is an accomplishment in and of itself. Um, she stands her ground. She interprets the Constitution and she will speak her mind when it's not the popular thing to say. She doesn't mind when people disagree with her. I love the dynamics and the relationships between her and Justice Scalia are fascinating. Um, and I will often chant her by inner notorious RGB, as her fans call her. When I'm in a meeting and I've got some thoughts in my head, I'm like, I really need to say this out loud, I really need to say this out loud. And it's a somewhat intimidating situation. Or when I'm in a co when I, at a conference with 500 people and it comes time to ask the speaker a question and I want to stand up in front of 500 people and I'm like, Ooh, I just go, all right, what would RGB do, Jamie? And it's amazing how she instantly gets me to stand up. So our role models can be people that we know, and they can be people that we don't know. When I was a kid, I loved Barbara Walters. <laughs> she was another one I just always looked up to. This is so important to me, in fact, that I set a reminder in my phone that on a daily basis, it prompts me to do a little exercise of where I'm either giving out confidence or receiving it. And as a side note, I want to mention, there are sheets on the tables. Um, I would really love your feedback from this presentation, and I'll mention it later on, but I just want to mention it now that there are certain topics on there that we'll talk about today, and if you want more information on it, I would love to share that with you. Not all of them we'll cover today, but if you're interested in the other ones on there, I would also love to share that with you. Um, I'm also in the process of writing a book, and we'll need some test readers, so if there's any reason at all that you want to keep in contact, and I would love to keep in contact with every single one of you, um, please fill out the sheets, and I would welcome all the feedback. And I'll remind you again later. Okay. So move right along. So let's see if we can identify what confidence looks like. Looks like. So let's take a look at this little dude. What do we what do we think? Confident or not? Yes. Definitely. And and what what makes us say that? What makes us think that? Posture? Expression? Eye contact? So if we were all about to go play a game of Red Rover or kickball, and we were picking teams, would you pick him to be on your team? Yes. Yeah. Simply by how he's looking at us, how he's standing. And he's dressed the part, right? Let's take a look at another one. What about this woman? Yeah. And why do we say that about her? Same thing. Dressed professionally, closed at fit, making eye contact. Well groomed. What about this fella? <laughs> okay, and, and, and I'm sensing a no on this one. Uh, why do we think that? Looking down. What about the placement of his hands? Covering his face. Covering his face. So this one is really interesting. And it's something that you can test out on teenagers, on students, anyone whose veracity you're questioning when they're telling you a story. Uh, if you want a lie detector test, just notice where someone's hands are when they're speaking. Body language experts will tell you that our bodies speak louder than our words. And when we are questioning our words and when we're not projecting confidence or when we're telling an all out lie, our hands are closer to our face because we're trying to cover our words. So, yeah, right? Um, so the next time that you're in a meeting, you're trying to sell someone an idea, and again, especially when it's something that's new, you don't know the actual outcome, right? But you believe in it, right? And you've got this. Sit on your hands if you have to. Interlace your fingers. Just make sure if you interlace your fingers, you don't bring it up because they might think you're praying and that could give a mixed, <laughs> a mixed message. Cover your prayers beforehand. Um, but yeah, the hands by the face. There's, there's another gentleman in the back that he's kind of doing the same thing, like, I, I don't know, I'm not so sure. So something to keep in mind. What about this lovely lady? 
Yep, eye contact. She's, it looks like she's got a really good lock on that, that firm handshake as if she's testing a melon in the grocery store to see if it's the right, uh, it's the right level of ripeness. You know, it's interesting because it's actually men and women that tend to struggle a little bit on the handshake side of things, and it's so important. Uh, in January, I was at a conference, Rocky Mountain Association of Geologists Conference, I'm sure there were graduates there, uh, and the CEO of the company, a man, was saying to one of my male counterparts, it was kind of downtime in between, and he said, hey man, shake my hand. And it was kind of like middle of the day, like we, we've already greeted each other. And I'll call him Ned. Ned looked at him and said, okay, and he shook his hand, and the CEO said to him, hey, don't, don't break your, gl your glance with me. Don't break that eye contact. He said, I noticed that when you're shaking hands of our customers, you tend to look away, and you look down. And Ned very humbly said, you know what, you're, you're right, I, I do do that, I'm just, I'm kind of uncomfortable. And what the CEO then said to him was, so our customers need to believe in our company. And we all have customers, they might be defined a little differently, but we all have customers, right? Uh, but if our customers are going to believe in us, they first need to believe in you, which means you need to believe in yourself, and 100% indication of that is if you can hold eye contact. Now this can be very tricky, I know, if you're shy or if you're introverted, so here's a pro tip on this. If you look at someone right between the eyes, or even right on the forehead, it's not a big enough difference for them to distinguish and think like, where, where is she looking? Um, but it'll alleviate some of that stress that can be caused if, if that's out of your comfort zone. So that's a little trick to try. But yes, I would definitely say that she is confident. Now this photo, there's all kinds of things going on here, right? Uh, where would you say toward closer to us or, or farther from us are the, are the more confident ones? Right. And we know that, why? Because they're engaged, they're leaning in, they're making eye contact, they're not looking down at their phones. Um, this poor lady right here, I really, I feel for her. If I were doing a coaching session with her, the first thing I would say to her is, hey, scoot in your chair. The first thing I do when I'm at a table and there's chairs with the levers is I, I bump that sucker up because I need to be at eye contact with everyone. And I don't want to be higher and I don't want to be lower. And even if I have to rest my feet on the feet of the chair rather than the floor, that's what I will do to show like, hey, I'm here. Another uh, technique that you can use in meetings is we're all mountain girls here. We've I'm sure taken survival classes. What do they teach us to do if we happen to encounter a bear in the woods? Get big, right? It's a very similar survival skill in a meeting. Establish your real estate. Make sure you take up some space on that table. See the women in the back, I like how they have their hands and their arms on the table in an appropriate kind of way. I take a notebook, a laptop, a coffee mug, a water bottle, just some things to mark my territory and establish my turf and let my presence be known. So quick little, who knew, just pushing in your chair could allow you to project more confidence. Aw, and then what about this one? <laughs> tiny little kitten staring in the mirror and seeing this big, powerful lion staring back. I had mentioned thoughts before, and I want to come back to that now. Our ability to think about what we can do is just, it's an incredible capability. I mean, manifesting is a real thing, and the thoughts that you're telling yourself and the message that you're sending is what you then project to others, right? So this is so powerful. I want to show you a science experiment that was done on this. Our brains cannot actually distinguish imagination from reality. I was having this conversation with my mom, and she looked at me very skeptical, so let me, let me explain further. The row of uh, images that you see on the top, those are brain images of someone who is physically playing piano. They're sitting at the bench, their fingers are moving, their, feet is, their foot is uh, tapping the pedal, they can hear the piano, they can feel the piano, they're actually playing piano. The row on the bottom shows brain scans of someone simply thinking about playing piano. I mean, look how similar those are. It's almost identical. I was a diver in high school, and when we were learning dives, we would wear sweatshirts <laughs> because it would help, um, it would help it would sort of help with the bruising situation when you're smacking on the water before you perfect your dive. I later learned that in China, before they even step on a diving board, they spend a year thinking through their dives. 
I'm sure they had far less bruises <laughs> than we did. Pretty powerful stuff. So here's another example. Uh, the good old, if you think about this and you really try and hear it in your head, the nails on a chalkboard, like, uh, yeah, I mean, some of you are reacting right now. There's no chalkboard in this room, or maybe anywhere on this campus anymore, and, and you know, nails on a whiteboard don't have quite the same effect, but um, just that, I mean, nothing actually happens, right? It's just our imagination, and yet we react. Another example is scary movies. What happens when you're sitting at your house, you know, the alarm set, you're perfectly safe, right? And you're watching a scary movie, what happens? Heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature. My dad piped in at this, at this point as he was overhearing the conversation between my mom and myself, and he goes, oh, I was watching Bird Box late one night, you know, the Sandra Bullock blindfold, like, so stressful. yeah, so stressful. And he said the printer went off in the other, it's like midnight. The printer went off in the other room, he about rocked out of his lazy boy. And, you know, my dad in his 60s, like, clearly, <laughs> that wasn't real, right? But that's what we're telling, that's what we're absorbing, right? And so that's what we're going through. So we can use this, though, strategically. We can use this to our advantage to instantly channel our confidence. So there's also an element of, okay, so I know that now. I can just fake it till I make it, right? Right? You guys know there's a catch. <laughs> so instead of fake it till you make it, I like to say something else. Because fake it till you make it, to me, just implies that there's something fraudulent. And that when you're doing something for the first time or the second time, or maybe even the 60-second time, we're still not in that place of perfection. And so you're saying, like, ah, I'm doing this, but I don't think I'm really doing it right. And, you know, that message is so different than if, like, oh, I'm just doing this. So perfection is a dangerous place, and I know because I'm a recovering perfectionist, and that's not the goal. But what I like to say instead is that all we're doing is practicing and rehearsing until it's first, <coughs> until it just becomes so easy, and so I got this. Until your Derek Jeter is standing in the shortstop position, like, yeah, hit it to me. So just rehearse until it's first. And think about just on yourself, like how much easier that is on yourself. I'm like, hey, it's okay, I'm just, I'm trying. And I can celebrate the success simply in trying. Okay? All right, so now here's the part where we're gonna role play for 12, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would never, I would never, it's a golden rule violation 100%, I wouldn't do that to you. But we are going to channel some confidence. So if you would please, everybody stand up. Okay, so most of you have probably heard, I have back up, was um, Most of you have probably heard of Amy Cuddy and the, and the power poses. Has anyone heard of this? She's a you know, brilliant psychologist from Harvard. I mean, it's no school of mine, but Harvard is a <laughs> brilliant psychologist from Harvard. And she did a study that showed that simply standing in a power pose for approximately two minutes can decrease, or, I'm sorry, increase testosterone levels by 20%, which is a, is a bravery factor, and decrease cortisol, stress hormone, by 25%. So there's a few different ways to do this. And I want you to just kind of play around and have fun with this, as we're, we're not in judgment zone here, right? Um, but there's a few different ways. So the first one is simply standing, or just chest out, feet about shoulder distance apart, just those deep breaths. If you skipped your lunch yoga session to be here, I'm gonna make up for it right now. Just these deep breaths, and I want you to stand there and your hands down by your side. A uh, gentleman I know in Cleveland who's in commercial real estate, he, he takes this and he has another element and he said he pumps his fists. Like so hard that he's like digging his nails into his palms. He goes, Jamie, I do this every time before I walk into a meeting where I need my, my A game and man, I can like hear Eye of the Tiger in my head. <laughs> so th this is an option. Another one is to stand with your hands on your hips. And at the risk of embarrassing myself, I'm going to share something with you. I don't know if it was from years of jazz lessons and spirit fingers and all that, but when I do this, I instantly like get some sass, and so I can't, I can't do this one. <laughs> That's not what I'm going for. But if that works for you, please take it as your own. And then another version is to stand with your arms straight out like this, or even up like she has them in the picture, as if these walls are closing in on us, and it's our job to keep them out. And I'll tell you, a really fun added bonus to this one, ladies, is that this is also a toning and firming exercise. <laughs> so that will ensure that the only curtains you have are the ones hanging in your living room and not, you know, some of this action that we have as we tend to get older. 
All right, so I'm going to tell you a quick story, and I want you to stand and play around with your poses while I'm telling you this. So I was working with a mixed martial artist uh, named Mark, and we were talking about some self-defense techniques. And he said to me, just kind of as an aside, well, Jamie, you don't have victim mentality. And I was like, Mark, what's victim mentality? And he said, there's survivor mentality, and there's victim mentality. And when attackers are assessing who they might go after, they avoid women or men, um, I'll use women in our case today, they would avoid women who look like they're going to fight back. They might be able to overpower you at the end of the day, but they don't want to deal with anybody who's even going to fight back. And it's simply based on how we're standing, how we're walking, just the vibe that we're putting off. I thought about that at another level of like, hmm, what sort of mentality am I projecting when I'm walking into meetings, when I'm giving a presentation, when I'm going to a dinner party where I don't know anyone? Or a bridal shower, you know, those situations are like, great, I get to go and I talk to a soul. But you walk in and just, you know, how you present yourself is so important. It's the message that you're sending yourself primarily and then to others. So strike your, strike your pose one more time. Okay, and the next layer of this is we're going to say three mantras. Now, if you want to say this out loud, if you want to say it in your head, either way is fine with me because we're just rehearsing till it's first right now. Three characteristics that describe you at your highest, best self. I am brave, I am courageous, I am strong, I am outgoing, I am a leader, I am fierce. That tends to be like a really good hashtag fierce new buzzword lately. Any of those. So just three. I'll give you some suggestions here. You need some. Just three in your head. I am awesome. I am a leader. I am deserving. I am tough. I am an amazing friend. All right, does everybody have their three? Okay, now the last layer of this, I want you to simply turn up the corners of your mouth and smile and laugh and give yourself a great big round of applause. <laughs> you, you, you may be seated. Now I feel like we're in church. You may be seated. <laughs> so that, that is a technique that you can do anytime you want your A game. And today, right now, I mean, the first time you do it, some of you might be ready to go run up to the M and forego the rest of this presentation. <laughs> I'll stay and keep talking if you want, but um, it's something that you can do anytime. You can do it in your car, granted you're not standing but sitting and pumping, I mean, you can still do that in those I am statements. I mean, yellow in your car. Do it in the bathroom before you're going into, like I said, an A-game situation, whether it's a meeting or some new curriculum that you're presenting or even if you have, um, you know, if you have a stern conversation with your kid's coach, any of those situations. I, I practice my material on my husband sometimes, who's 6'3", former naval intelligence, and pretty, you know, steadfast and confident in his ways. Later that evening, I was over, <laughs> was listening to him talk to a contractor on the phone who had a different sense of urgency for a kitchen rehab than we had, and just listening to my husband speak to him, I was hearing just, I don't know, different different kind of language, different kind of confidence in his voice that I hadn't heard before, and I couldn't help but think it had something to do with the exercises that we had just done. Uh, remember how I was saying before that confidence is contagious? This is a great thing to practice with your kids, with your students, because the energy that you'll have with each other, and when it's less awkward and more like, okay, we did the first round, I got it, um, and now you're just playing around with it, I mean, it will instantly channel more confidence. Incidentally, this is one of the items on the list that if you want me to send you what we just did, I'd be happy to do that. So it's a magical tool. I use it all the time. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how we can apply some confidence in workplace settings that happen quite frequently. Change management and conflict resolution. Now, each of these topics we could spend an entire day on one alone, um, but for our purposes today and the time we have, I've, I've blended some techniques that will work on both sides. So they say that the only person who likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. <laughs> All day, every day, anytime, please. And they go from this to this in just a matter of seconds, right? I would venture to say that there are more people other than babies that like change. What about this guy? I'm pretty sure he's psyched when it's shift change and he can bend his elbows and bend his knees and crack a smile, let alone a joke. Or what about this beautiful creature who started out literally crawling on the ground 
to then be wound up tight inside a barrier, busted through that fence, spread her wings, and can now fly. Change is awesome. Best thing that ever happened to her, right? A lot of times what happens with change is that when we don't understand the benefit on the other side, that's what's kind of scary. And it can be difficult in a workplace environment because sometimes those things are communicated and sometimes they're not. And there's some unknowns and we still have to navigate within that. But let me ask you this question because I know you like change too. How many of you had a smartphone 10 years ago? You might have been still rocking the crack there. Are they 2007, so it's possible. How many of you have a smartphone now? And how many of us have experienced maybe a little bit of frustration or trepidation when we can't figure out how to attach a picture or we fat fingered something or the GPS will not stop talking or you know those that are it goes off while it's sitting on a podium, right? But we stick with it and we persevere because we know the benefit on the other side. Even my 93-year-old Nana had a smartphone. She called it her smart ass phone. <laughs> but she persevered because she understood the benefit on the other side. So here's some just tips and tricks to help manage this better with some confidence along with it. All right, so one of the best things that you can do, especially in the face of conflict, is do a proper situational assessment. And what I mean by that is put on your CSI golden hat and think, do I know all sides of the story? Identify the sides that you know, identify the ones that you don't know. If you can get the ones that you don't know, that's great. But otherwise, we need to just kind of acknowledge, all right, I, I don't have the full picture. And there's some, there's a bit of a sense of calm when you can actually focus on what you do know rather than, than what you don't. So that's step, step one. The next one is to eliminate assumptions. There's all kinds of stories that we tell ourselves. It's just, how, it's just how our brains learn. One of the best ways to make sure to do your assumption check if you're having trouble doing it, because you're in the situation, right? The frog in the boiling pot of water metaphor is to take it to someone who doesn't know the other players who are involved, doesn't really know the people, doesn't know the personalities, and wouldn't just connect off because they don't have the information, and have them kind of bounce ideas off of you. Could it be this? Could it be that? And see if you can kind of downplay some of those assumptions. There's a great book called The Four Agreements. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, they spend a quarter of the book talking about how to not assume, uh, so you may want to check that out. The next one is no emotion. Try and take the emotion out of it, which might take a few hours or overnight to do, but it's amazing how much more clearly we can think when we can step aside a little bit and look at something more logically. I have a great girlfriend, very successful in the oil and gas industry, named Eglop. She's Russian, she's, she's a bit fire. And she said she'll get emails, inbound emails, that have a certain tone or have just an interpretation that she takes along with it. I, by the way, maybe at STEM school, someone will figure this out. Can someone please invent a sarcasm font? <laughs> I think it would just save so many communication errors, right? Uh, but there's an implied tone, and she'll fire back her response. She'll delete the to field before she types her response. She'll save it as a draft, she'll sleep on it, and then she'll reread both in the morning. 99% of the time, she will rewrite that email. So I know it's hard, but just you know, a little extra attention and awareness. Or again, that's another thing. You can think, if I had never met this person on the other side of this email, how would I be interpreting this? And then reply that way. Give them the benefit of the doubt, even if they don't really deserve it, but that's okay. Okay. Next, be intentional about what you can do. At my company right now, we're going through a situation where there was an SAP to Microsoft conversion and some things went fine and others did not, and there are literally parts of my job that I cannot do right now. So I am focusing on what I can do so I can keep that forward motion and keep mindful of my accomplishments and what I can be doing in the midst of the areas that I, I, they're out of my control, right? Then on top of that, you can identify the tasks that are critical to your success, to your fulfillment in your job, and maybe run them past your team. Maybe run them past your higher up and say, hey, this is what I'm working on, or you know, are we aligned, are we on the same page here? And so then everybody can be like, all right, we're still moving yeah, we're, uh, and we're still accomplishing yeah. in the midst of change, in the midst of a conflict. And then the last one is that you get to decide. You get to be Eeyore, you get to be Tigger, you get to decide. 
And it might reach a point where it's an environment that's so toxic that it's just not good for you to be there, and that's okay too, but ultimately you get to decide how that gets handled, right? And then there's a really, really neat thing that happens when you can work on these things. Some will go better than others. Some days you'll nail it. Some days you'll just be trying. But the beautiful thing that you get to maintain and keep when you can go with this, anybody care to guess? Sanity. I know I really appreciate my sanity, as does my husband, as does everyone who works with me. So that's a good way to go. All right, so let's wrap it all up here with a couple points. Um, back to Derek Jeter, because why not, right? So this is a chart of Derek Jeter's batting average, essentially. Throughout his career with the New York Yankees, he hovered around 300, which per Major League Baseball standards is pretty darn good. That means, though, his hits, which you see in the red, versus his outs, which are in the gray, happened one out of every three times that he got up to bat. Two out of every three times, double, he got an out. He set the bat down, or threw it, or whatever he did, walked back to the dugout, and sat down. Now, when he got back to the dugout, what do you think he did? Do you think he beat himself up and said, oh, I messed up again, I'm never gonna be able to do this, what's gonna happen eight players later when I gotta get back up to the plate again, I can't do it, I'm not gonna get a hit? I doubt it. I bet he probably did a bit of an assessment, a situational assessment, what went right, what went wrong, and the next time he walked up, he was like, I got this. Granted, they were paying him $10 million either way, but we can do this same thing. Maybe not quite that in combined, but um, we can do the same thing. And a lot of the point is, like I said in the beginning, it's not so much the outcome, but it's the act. It's just that ability to try to step up to the plate and to know and to give yourself a pat on the back simply for doing that. We're not going to get a hit every time we get up to bat, but unless we get up to bat, we'll never get that hit, right? So, um, quick reminder about your surveys. I would love to keep in touch with you, and I would love your unabashed feedback. Um, there's another section that I talk about how to, how to interpret uh, criticism as a compliment. We've got some wild stories on that one. Um, so if you have criticism, I, I would truly love to hear it. I want to make this program better and better. Um, I started this project officially over a year ago um, and have had some really cool results come from it and I want to continue to do it because it, what I see in the workplace all the time, I just it's, I think it's really important for women especially to know these things and be able to share it with each other. So thank you in advance for that. And then I know we're here at a, at a STEM school, but I want to take a little journey over to the liberal arts side and, and close with a poem. That I like to call that I like to call an ode to confidence. The power that she has is a gift I sure hope she'll know. Her ability to influence, to succeed, and to grow. Her energy is contagious, and her capability is immense. She knows to get out there in order to test that fence. Perfection is not needed. In some cases, it can be a curse. Her job is simply to practice and rehearse. Remember? Until it's verse. Well done. The confidence she projects is a gift to be shared amongst us all. And when in the face of challenges, it's her secret weapon to always stand tall. She's keen on her strengths, and she knows certain tasks are key. And when it comes game time, she steps up to the plate, saying, yes, hit it to me. Thank you very much, ladies. Jamie, thank you so much. That was a fabulous presentation. I learned lots of things. We had her come and talk to our SWE students, and she was declared as one of the best speakers we had for SWE. So I thought, great, she should come and talk to employees. And I'm glad she mentioned some of the conflict resolution and change, because I mentioned we've had a little bit of change around here over the last year. And um, so hopefully you found some of those tips and suggestions useful. So thank you again for coming, Jamie. And best of luck to all of you for the uh, successful and hopefully somewhat relaxing rest of your semester. And uh, just good luck and thanks for coming.